Welcome to this instructional video from Vixus. The topic in this video is the SORA step number 9. The SORA process has 10 steps, and most of them are fairly straightforward, like step 2 on the ground risk and step 4 on the air risk. However, the 9th step called adjacent area and airspace can be a bit tricky to grasp. So, in this video, we will review what step number 9 is and to what extent it is relevant for your operations. The SORA step number 9 has two parts. The first is part B, which applies to everyone that operates according to a SORA, and this part always applies independently of your operations. The second part is part C, which applies to some types of operations in some cases. As a rule of thumb, it applies if you fly close to gatherings of people or to airports. Both parts put some requirement on your operation in order to avoid a flyaway of your drone. A flyaway is basically the situation where the drone happily flies in some unintended direction and you are unable to do anything about it. Part B, which everyone must comply with, requires that a flyaway happens less often than once per aircraft lifetime. Part C requires that a flyaway happens less often than once per 10,000 flight hours, and that any single failure on the drone cannot result in a flyaway. It is clearly stated in the text to step 9 that you need to give evidence that you are able to comply with these requirements. In other words, it is not enough to just state in your operations manual that you have a solid and well-functioning drone, or that you know for a fact that it complies with the requirements. Now, let us try to be a bit more specific, and we will start with part B. So, imagine that you want to fly at some location, say here. But first, to understand the language of step 9, we need to know some terminology from the SORA semantic model. This is a model of the various flight zones found in the SORA. The area where you want to conduct your operations is drawn in green here exemplified by a circle. It doesn't have to be a circle. However, it is easier for me to draw, plus it keeps the graphics simple. Since we are flying and thus moving in 3D, we need to add an altitude limit to the area, which then becomes a volume, in this particular case, a cylinder. This volume is called the flight geography, and this is where your planned flight will take place. To allow for glitches in your operation, such as loss of GPS, using the wrong flight path, or the pilot falling asleep, there is an additional area around your flight geography. And this too has an altitude limit, thus making it a volume. And this bigger volume is called the contingency volume, and it completely surrounds the flight geography. These two volumes together are called the operational volume. In the semantic model, there is an additional volume called the air risk buffer. But it is optional, and it is not used in step 9, so we will disregard it here. We now get the first hint of what exactly step 9 is about. Because the airspace outside the operational volume is what we call adjacent airspace. How much of the outside airspace is effectively adjacent really depends on the range of your aircraft. For a smaller aircraft with limited range, the adjacent airspace may extend perhaps a few kilometers from the operation volume, but for a long-range fixed-wing aircraft, it could easily be tens of kilometers. The adjacent airspace may have other uses in it. That could be gliders, helicopters, private jets, military aircraft, and even parachutes. For this reason, it is in fact rather important that your aircraft does not leave the operational volume, as in, actually, important. Now, let's take a look at how Step 9 Part B describes how important it really is. Here is your aircraft, ready to do its thing. It takes off, starts the operation, but then you have a flyaway where the aircraft leaves the operational volume. Step 9 Part B says that this, this should happen less often than once per aircraft lifetime. Wait a minute, I hear you say, what does that mean? 
what is aircraft lifetime, and how can something happen less than once? The short answers are somewhere between 100 and 1,000 hours, and things can happen less often than once, at least in the sense of averaged probabilities. You can find the longer answers in our instructional video on probabilities. By the way, leaving the flight geography is perfectly fine as long as you have appropriate contingency procedures to handle this event. You recall that Part B applies always. It applies when you fly in a rural area, it applies when you fly in an urban area, it even applies when you fly in an airport environment. It simply always applies. For Step 9 Part C the setting is a bit different. Let's start by going back to the operational volume. The semantic model has one more area that we need to know about. This is a buffer on the ground and it separates the operational volume from the surrounding area. It is appropriately named ground risk buffer. Note that unlike the air risk buffer, the ground risk buffer is not optional. Now, everything outside the ground risk buffer is called adjacent ground area. Well, obviously, this doesn't include the entire planet, but it does include any area that the drone may be able to reach during a flyaway. Let us now see how this relates to Step 9 Part C. We clean this up a little bit. So, again, we have your drone. It takes off, fly for a bit. And again, we have a flyaway. Now, in this case, it exits not only the operational volume, but also the ground risk buffer and fly out over adjacent ground area. The STORA step number 9 part C says that the first event must happen less often than once per 10,000 flight hours, while for the second event, no single failure must lead to it. Remember how part B applies always. Well, part C applies only to some flights. And what are only some flights? There are four specific situations where Part C applies. 1. If you fly next to an assembly of people. This could be a crowded beach, it could be a sports event, shopping street and so on. Places where people generally cannot easily move out of the way if your aircraft comes crashing. 2. If you're flying next to an airport or an airport-like environment. The two other situations only apply if you're operating in an urban area. So, three, if you're using M1 mitigations. This is an option you have in step number three in the SORA process, and it typically means that you are using special circumstances to mitigate the risk, such as flying during nighttime where there are less people on the street. The fourth situation is when you're operating in a controlled ground area inside an urban area. A controlled ground area means that the operational volume and ground risk buffer is inside some perimeter that you can keep your public out. So, let's summarize what we have learned about the SORA step number 9 about adjacent area and airspace. It comes in two parts. Part B, which applies to everyone and always, and Part C, that applies in some circumstances, such as flying close to people or airports. The purpose is to reduce the risk of a flyaway to an acceptable level. For Part B, this level is less often than once per aircraft lifetime, and for Part C, it is less often than once per 10,000 flight hours, and that no single failure can lead to a flyaway. Both of these requirements may need some interpretation. Fortunately, we have an instruction video on probabilities that dives into exactly these requirements, and you can find it on the VIXAS website. And finally, you're required to give some evidence that you are in compliance with Part B and potentially Part C. What this evidence could be and what form it can take, we discuss in yet another instruction video, which of course is also available on our website. From the team at Vixus, we hope you found this video useful and now you know a little more about how SORA Step Number 9 works. If you're interested in seeing more Vixus videos, do visit our website at vixus.dk.